Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making the start of my review of Quest in Paradise by David Attenborough. So this is a non-fiction book, it's like travel writing slash memoirs with a bit of science writing thrown in as well. It's actually sort of two books, or at least it's in two parts about two different adventures. The first part is The Birds of Paradise, and the second part is The People of Paradise. Uh, it was first published in 1960, this is a 1963 edition. Tiny print, but um, you know, hey ho. It also has some images inside actually, which is quite cool. I mean, they're all black and white. Obviously, it's a product of its time. And um, I picked this out because one of my friends, I've been getting them to pick out random numbers that correspond to books on my wish list, um, just to help me to select which books to read next, I guess. And this is one of the ones they picked, and I did enjoy it. So I'm gonna read you this very short blurb, and then I'm gonna go through, check out my tabs, and give it my overall thoughts and rating at the end. The sensational land divers of Pentecost, the incredible cargo court of Tanner, Firewalking and the calling of turtles in Fiji, a strange and rarely seen ceremony on Tonga, the fabled dance of the wonderful birds of paradise in New Guinea. Quest in Paradise, David Attenborough's vivid and exciting account of his two voyages of discovery in the primitive and exotic islands of the South Seas. And so most of the stuff that I want to read here is just kind of quotes where he, I, I'll just read them out because it's what he's talking about is what's interesting. So he's talking about this expedition that happened and he said, Next year, with his 21-year-old brother Dan and Jim Taylor, a government officer, he climbed the mountain wall. He reached the top, looked over and saw, as he had hoped he would, a wild, fertile valley. The next day, as the party marched into it, they were met by a wonderful and strange people, wearing magnificent headdresses of bird of paradise plumes. These people had never seen white men before, nor had they heard of the existence of the sea. They had no knowledge of metal and were armed with huge stone war axes. Not only had the explorers discovered a new valley, which was to become known as the Wagi, but they had also discovered a new people. Yeah, there are a lot of proper nouns here for place names and people names and stuff that were quite difficult to follow at times. He used the word laughingly, which uh, is one of my pet hates. I hate it when writers use that word. The writing itself is kind of quite old school as well, as you would imagine from like the 1960s. But it does read like you can tell that David Amber is the one who wrote it. You kind of read it in his voice. And um, yeah, they're talking about the birds of paradise here with a guy called Barry. Um, and yeah... He, this comes up a few times how like some people would consider a place a paradise and some others wouldn't you know it, it really depends on the perspective of the person who's looking at it so uh, Barry was silent over breakfast but I was so excited by what I had seen that I became extremely talkative I can't tell you how thrilled I am to be here I said to him already I've seen five fully plumed lesser birds of paradise flying in the forest just below us there must be thousands of ornithologists who would give anything to stay in this house even for only a few days how wonderful it must be to live here throughout the year with these gorgeous creatures on your very doorstep. I continued to enthuse, but could get no reaction from him. It's just possible, Charles murmured, that Barry doesn't particularly like birds of paradise. Barry looked up from his plate of porridge. That's not true, he said seriously. I love them. Nicely browned and with a good gravy. They're delicious. I think this is cute as well because this shows like his love for animals. Um, so he says uh, he's got some... I'm going to read this out. Uh, they've got some parrots that he was taking back with him. It was imperative to give them some food immediately and I took them back to the house, so beginning a process which over the next few days was to transform Barry's immaculate home into something resembling the annex of a zoo. He viewed the parrot's arrival with a stoical calm. Fortunately, the little creatures were old enough to be able to eat by themselves and readily nibble bananas. But bananas alone would not, I knew, sustain them for long and it was vital that I should persuade them to eat some seeds as well. I had brought with me a small supply of sunflower seeds but the parrots, never having seen such things before, did not regard these shiny, polished, tasteless objects as food. Accordingly, I spent a long time that day, and many days that followed, cracking each seed, extracting the kernels, and sticking them into bananas. The chicks, in their eagerness to eat their bananas, inadvertently took some of the kernels and soon acquired a taste for them. Eventually, before we left New Guinea, the little birds were shelling the seeds for themselves and eating them with enthusiasm. I thought this was interesting. The start of chapter 8, The Dancing Birds, he says, The next morning, as we waited for our plane to arrive, I began to worry. The reception on Aomi's radio was so bad that we had been unable to confirm our charter and I found it hard to believe that the verbal arrangements we had made weeks before in the civilised surroundings of Leh would necessarily result in the materialisation of an aircraft on this particular day in precisely this remote corner of primitive New Guinea. I invented for myself numerous fanciful reasons why the plane should not come. Perhaps we had made a mistake in counting the days we had spent in the jimmy and today, after all, was not the one we had specified for the rendezvous. Maybe the official with whom I had spoken at Leigh Airport had succumbed to a bad attack of some vicious tropical disease and, before he was taken to hospital, had forgotten to mention our arrangement to his colleagues. Or perhaps there were two places called Aomi and New Guinea, and at that very moment the plane was flying to the wrong one. I thought this was funny as well, he's talking about when they're loading the animals onto this plane. 
The pilot, however, had no such qualms. He glanced cursorily at the loads lined up on the margin of the airstrip and calling for them one at a time, began to pat them systematically into the plane's hold. The snake cage was almost the first he selected and, when he heard what was inside, he asked me to put an extra fastening on the lid, remarking mildly that if, during the flight, a python appeared between his legs, his mind might be distracted from aviating. And there was this bit uh, where there were both English and French uh, like official places here and it said, uh, in spite of the wholehearted attempts of government officials of both nationalities to avoid petty jealousies, this rivalry is carried to extraordinary lengths. Accurate measurements had to be made of the flagpole at each residency to make sure that they were both of the same height, for it would, of course, have dreadful implications if the tricolour was either higher or lower than the Union Jack. For similar reasons, it would be impossible for the islands to adopt exclusively either a British or a French, in French institution. Thus, there are two currencies, francs and Australian pounds, two systems of weights and measures, two police forces and two medical services. And they were talking about this boat, and it was a very loud boat, and they were off to go and meet some natives. Um, so, enjoy the ride, boys, he asked, sitting down with a glass of iced beer. Yes, very much indeed, I replied untruthfully. It's a very nice launch, but she's a little on the noisy side, isn't she? Is the muffler broken? Good lord, no, replied Oscar. In fact, it's lying around in the workshop somewhere, almost brand new. The damn thing worked so well that the engine made nothing but a low purring noise. You could hardly hear it. Well, that's no damn good in this part of the world. We used to arrive at a landing to collect some copper and then spend the next couple of hours yelling our heads off to let the bushies know that we'd arrive. So we took the muffler off. Now they can hear us coming while we're still five miles away and they're always on the beach to meet us. We get a casual dropping of the C word, uh, the racist term. Not going to say it. Although, to be fair, it wasn't Attenborough who said it. He was just reporting that somebody else had said it. So we have this local story about a ceremony that's held where they kind of like jump off a cliff, basically. <laughs> so he says, I puzzled for a long time on what could be the meaning of this spectacular ceremony. Wall, who in his youth had been a famous jumper, told me the story of the ritual's origin. Many years ago, a man from one of the Pentecost villages discovered that his wife was being unfaithful to him. He tried to catch her in order to beat her, but she ran from him and in an attempt to escape climbed up a palm tree. He climbed after her and when he reached the top they began to argue. Why did you go to another man? he asked. Am I not man enough for you? No, she said. You are a weakling and a coward. You dare not even jump to the ground from here. That is impossible, he said. I can do it, said the woman. Then if you do it, so will I. Let us jump together. So they jumped. The wife had taken the precaution of tying the end of one of the palm leaves to her ankles so that she came to no harm, but the man was killed. The other men of the village were greatly humiliated that one of their sex should have been tricked by a woman. So they built a tower many times higher than a palm tree and started the jumping ceremony to prove to the women who came to watch them that they are, after all, the superior sex. So bearing in mind I hate the word smilingly, you would think I would hate unsmilingly, but I actually felt like it worked here, he said. They looked at us unsuspiciously and unsmilingly. Weird that I like unsmilingly more than smilingly, isn't it? This is kind of a, a story that I've heard a lot about man meddling with nature here. Um, so mo most of the animals we saw were also of foreign descent, but man, since his arrival in the Pacific Islands, has added greatly to their fauna, and we saw several of his introductions as we, as we drove towards Suva. Semi-wild pigs grubbed in copra plantations, slim rangy creatures whose precise origin is something of a mystery. They were most probably introduced by man himself, but when and by whom is uncertain. Several times a more exotic creature scuttled across the road in front of our car, a mongoose. These creatures were imported into Fiji from India in the 1880s to help combat the great numbers of rats which had accidentally been brought to the islands on merchant ships and which had multiplied until vast numbers of them infested the sugar plantations. Within 10 years, however, the mongooses had become pests themselves. They also began to raid hen roosts and to kill great numbers of the wild birds. Now they are probably the most abundant of all the wild animals. So yeah, I thought there was some great stuff in this. You definitely kind of read it in Attenborough's voice as well. It's great to read at the moment when you can't get out and about because you get a little bit of like travel writing, a bit of biology. The stuff on the cargo courts was fascinating as well. Overall, I gave it like a 3.5 out of 5. It was, it was all right. So there we have it. That's what I made of Quest in Paradise by David Attenborough. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more. And I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.